Hi, this is David Smith with No Kill Colorado. I'm here today with Alan Rosenberg from New Jersey Animal Observer and Aubrey Cavanaugh from No Kill Onsville. We're taking, um, we're, uh, we're looking at some of the questions that we get um, in on the No Kill Movement site. Um, we kind of collect those. If you ever have any, please message us, us there and we will, um, uh, you know, we'll do these every once in a while and answer some questions that come through. Uh, the first one we got was from an Amy in North Carolina. You talk all the time about the no-kill equation. Why do you support that philosophy and how does it compare to the Haas shelter model? Um, I'm going to start with you, Alan. What do you think of that? Well, let's start with what no-kill is. No-kill, when you distill it down to one important thing, the fundamental thing is respect for life. No kill is all about not killing healthy and treatable animals in the context of animal shelters. And the way we accomplish that in, in practice um, is to implement what we call the no kill equation. So when an animal control shelter gets in lots of animals, it has to have robust programs to avoid getting them out alive, to avoid um, overcrowding or killing them. So what the no-kill equation does, it has programs that responsibly reduce the number of animals coming into the shelter and increases the number of animals leaving the shelter alive and also providing excellent care to the animals while they're at the shelter. Haas is effectively uh, very similar in many ways. What is, when you look at Haas, essentially what it's doing is it's emphasizing two, maybe three key uh, uh, of the key 11 no-kill equation programs, mm -hmm. which are pet retention, foster care, as well as uh, excellent animal care to the animals. Um, one thing about Haas is that's a little different than what we've seen in practice with no-kill is that they extend the pet retention uh, to not just owned animals, but also uh, animals that people find as strays in the street. Uh, depending on how a shelter implements Haas, it may involve just asking the finder to hold the animal, which actually isn't that different than what some no-kill shelters are doing today, to going as far as uh, mandating uh, the finder hold the animal, which is something that no-kill uh, shelters typically don't do today. Um, but the one thing that Haas doesn't have that I think it should have from no-kill is that it doesn't mandate a respect for life or no-kill philosophy. While certainly there are a lot of no-kill organizations involved with Haas, and Haas has certainly has some really excellent programming ideas that they've come up with, there are also a number of traditional kill shelters involved, including uh, the executive director of Maine Rescue Alliance, who's on the executive committee of Haas. So mm -hmm. as far as I've seen, Haas has not mandated that its practitioners uh, follow a no-kill philosophy, which I think is a mistake. I think we've talked in previous videos, uh, at least Aubrey and I have talked about Haas being um, a next step from no-kill, where a shelter um, achieves no-kill, the community it has credibility with its community that it has that respect for life, and then when it comes time when the shelter asks the community to do more, which Haas requires the community to do, the community would be more willing to do it. So I think when we look at shelters that have implemented Haas and have had some public relations issues, I think it's those shelters that have not demonstrated to the public they have that respect for life and uh, the public is therefore not supporting them in their mission. Right, and I think that that's a good example of, of, of what we have seen out there where, where it is working, where it is working, because I don't see any conflict in actually what they're trying to do. But they, they have avoided some of the language that we use to some degree, which is kind of unfortunate. Aubrey, what do you think? Um, I agree with everything that Alan had to say. Like we've talked about before, I think that Haas um, can be used by some shelters as an excuse to not um, fulfill their public safety function and to do less. Um, but then there are other places that are really using it in a positive way. I had a conversation with the director of a shelter in um, Tennessee a couple couple of weeks ago, and even though she's not one of the tier one or tier two locations for the Haas pilot program, she just said Haas makes perfect sense. So she's gone ahead and started to implement a lot of what Haas is focusing on to begin with to, to keep animals in existing homes. They, she has now uh, called her shelter um, a one-stop shop. 
Um, if people in the community need help, they, she wants them to come to her, whether it, they need help containing an animal or they need a little bit uh, help getting veterinary care, or maybe they need a dog house, or maybe they've got a pet with behavioral issues. They're, they're kind of like a, a, a all, a, just an animal services center so that people can come and get help um, and then that animal stays in the existing home and stays out of the animal shelter. And I'm all for that. I asked her how she's funding it. She said she's funding it uh, primarily through grants and private donations. So that's an example, like Alan said, of an animal shelter that's already adopted the, the essentially no-kill philosophies and they're really fine tuning using Haas as a focus. Um, I should mention that Haas is Human Animal Support Services for those of you out there that don't know that. And then that's, it's, that's the URL.com or .org, I don't remember. You should go out there, look at it, look at their values, their mission statement. Um, there are a lot of good programs. I am involved with it. Um, I do like what's going on in a lot of it. So uh, just go check it out. We're, we're going to try to move along here because we have some questions and we took a long time on that one. Um, we have another one from Gary. Gary, in, Gary from Michigan. Gary asks, how do you feel about fee-waived adoptions at tax-funded animal shelters? Doesn't that just invite people who can't afford an animal to adopt one? Well, um, I, I, I'm sure if, if anyone has ever listened to me, they know that I'm a big proponent of free adoptions. Um, the uh, uh, you know home checks or, or background checks or whatever you do to check on a person, um, you know, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's, it's not, the, the adoption fee does not actually make an animal any safer in my opinion. Um, but uh, Aubrey, what do you think? I'm, I've had this conversation with so many people over the years and I feel like people are usually in one camp or the other. And, and this is what I tell people, because what, what I'll hear, hear people say is, well, when you waive the fee, what does that say about the value of the animal? And my answer to that is pretty simple. The answer is that means you value the life of the animal more than you value some nominal adoption fee. Um, and essentially what we're doing when we either do fee waived adoptions or special promotions is it's a marketing tool. Just like you have other business industries that do special things to incentivize behavior. Um, what you're doing when you do that fee waived and you say, hey, the animals are free or, or name your price or $5 or $10 adoption fee and the animal is vetted, you know, spayed and neutered, chipped that makes that animal ready to go. And all you're doing is you're helping someone to make a decision maybe today as opposed to a few years from now. We all know that adopting an animal, it's a long-term commitment. I mean, these animals can live from 10 to 20 years. So you want people to make a smart decision, but sometimes if you incentivize that, it's a, it's a thing to get people's attention. Um, I would much prefer tax funded animal shelters to find funding to do fee waived adoptions than to march animals to the euthanasia room, use tax dollars that way and say, oh, well, we had no choice. I just remembered you wrote an article on this. I forget what it was called. What was the title? Oh my gosh, I'm I, I, I can't remember it off the top uh, of my you know, head. When, when we post this, we should put a link to that blog. It was a really, really good blog. Anything to add, um, Alan? Yes, um, I, I would say this. Um, anyone who thinks someone's gonna go to an animal shelter to get an animal to abuse because the fee is waived is absolutely crazy. <laughs> um, most shelters, you have to provide your driver's license as well as the animal has a microchip, which is gonna be identified back to you. So if you're gonna abuse an animal that you got for free or to reduce fee at an animal shelter, you're asking for trouble. You're going to jail, okay? That's number one. Number two, we all know that the vast majority of people that own pets in this country love them. They don't want to abuse them. And an even greater number of people that come to shelters, basically almost, certainly almost everyone coming to shelters is, is the same way. They're not looking to abuse animals, okay? The second thing is you have to think about the repercussions of not doing fee-waived adoptions. What happens if you don't do fee-waived adoptions and you're taking in thousands of animals to an animal control shelter with limited space and less than ideal conditions for animals. Remember, animals in animal shelters are in unnatural conditions. No animal, no, no dog or cat in their wild state or even their domestic state would ever live in that kind of proximity to that many animals of their own species and other species. 
So it stresses them out like crazy. And therefore you have behavioral decline and you have medical decline that ends up in those animals being killed. And in many cases, those animals before they uh, decline, uh, if the shelter is overcrowded, they could actually be suffering. So imagine just because it makes you feel good that, oh, uh, I have 100% assurance, which we know is not true because many people pay a high fee and still abuse animals, that the animal is safe because they pay this fee. The reality is you're causing thousands of other animals in that shelter, if it's a large shelter, to potentially suffer and potentially to be killed. So we have to look at the big picture here. So the idea that charging high fees gives someone some kind of comfort, which I would say is a false comfort, is, is just something that is detrimental to the well-being of many, many animals. So fee-waived adoptions should be a mandated program of any animal control shelter because it's just the right thing to do for all animals. Very right, point. So again, I think we all agree on that one. That's one that we don't even have. We, we don't even have the slightest uh, deviation from each other on. Um, we don't get to argue on that one. So I'm going to move on uh, to Margaret in California. Margaret asks, what can ordinary people do to try to learn how their shelter is functioning with tax dollars? And what can be done if animals are being needlessly killed? Um, um, I'm just going to throw this out before I ask you guys. I always tell people to go to, um, and it, it doesn't relate directly, but you should start here. Um, the No-Kill Advocacy Center, the Economics of No-Kill, um, I think it's called Dollars and Cents. I, it was one of the, uh, it was probably the second or third thing I ever read from the No-Kill Advocacy Center. It's one of my favorite publications to this day. I absolutely adore that, that, that publication. It really helps understand how money and life saving. Um, it, it probably got me to the point where I say this, at least once a week. Monday didn't save lives. It just makes it a heck of a lot easier. Um, that's it, you know, but you don't need it to actually do it. So, um, but what she's really asking is how the shelter is functioning with tax dollars. What can be done if animals are being needlessly killed, Aubrey? Well, having um, done advocacy work in a community for over a decade where the live release rate was really low when we started and now it's really high, I think that it's incumbent upon people to own their outrage. Um, I think that if you're outraged by the idea that healthy and treatable animals are being killed at your local animal shelter, you need to own it and you need to speak up about it. I mean, we, we hear all the time, I mean, people complain about potholes in the road, they complain about slow police response, they complain about sitting in a light that's been timed unnaturally. If they have to sit there for more than three minutes, people freak out and they call and complain about it. Well, if, if you're upset that, that animals are being destroyed using your money, um, complain. You need to speak out and let those people that are overseeing the animal shelter, particularly tax funded shelters that are overseen by elected officials, just tell them you're not okay with that and that you, you expect better. Um, as, a, as a foundation issue, if you're not sure what's going on at your local animal shelter, start out by going on their website and see if there's statistics on the website. Um, if they are killing a lot of animals, you're probably not gonna find the statistics on the website, to be honest. Then you can do, depending on um, where you live, it's called different things in different states, but you can do essentially what's a FOIA request, Freedom of, of Information Act request. In Alabama, it's called the Alabama Open Records Act, but you can do a letter and request the statistical data for the animal shelter to see for yourself what's going on. Um, once you have that data, um, you can figure out something called the live release rate, um, and not to plug my book, but I talk in my book real briefly about how you do that. It's a pretty simple equation. Um, and figure out what's happening with your money. And then if, if, if you determine that the vast majority of the animals in the building are being destroyed, uh, speak up, say something and just say, I, I'm not okay with this. Followed by, I know that there are places that are saving, you know, 95, 97, 98% of the animals. Why are we not doing that here? Right, okay, Alan? I, I would agree with everything Aubrey said. Um, the No-Kill Advocacy Center has a really excellent uh, shelter reform advocate guide that I would um, recommend everyone read. Uh, in, my, in, my, in my experience, the best thing is to use your public records acts or freedom of information acts in, in your state uh, to get records of animals, particularly the ones they're killing and why they're killing them. Um, it, it could be a little more complicated if it's a private shelter that, that, that runs a shelter. They may not be subject to the public records act. Uh, but there are other ways you could probably find information about those. 
Um, sometimes there's state reporting requirements. Sometimes you may have to network with people who work or volunteer there. Um, but long story short is get, get the information and make your case to public officials. Um, showing up at town council meetings or county or city council meetings uh, is the way to go. And, and start a reform meeting. Start, make a Facebook page um, and really start making your case. There are many uh, examples out there that you can follow that have been successful. Uh, FixAustin.org um, did it in Austin, Texas. Um, you can follow the model that they did, which I think is kind of a gold standard when we look at shelter reform advocacy movements. Uh, there's been others across the country that have done well, uh, but that is the most famous one. So don't recreate the wheel, follow what's been successful and you will win because at the end of the day, the public is on your side. They don't, okay. want, they don't want their shelters killing animals. I'm going to do the lightning round because we have about one minute before we run out of time. Hank in Indiana asks, why should people who don't have animals care about what happens at the local shelter? It doesn't seem like that big of a deal for people who don't have animals. What do you think there? I'm going to go back. I'm going to start with you again, Alan. What do you think there? Taxpayer money should be spent wisely. It must be spent because basically every state requires shelters to impound stray animals, at least stray dogs. So instead of using that money to kill animals, let's use that money to save them. And that's what the public wants. So the, so the government should spend the money in the way the public wants. All right, Aubrey. I, I agree with that completely. I think that people that don't share their lives with animals, they, they when they hear about animal shelter reform and they think, well, what's the, this doesn't affect me. What's the big deal? Um, I think that they may not realize that saving the lives of animals isn't, isn't an issue of spending. It's not that we need to spend more money. We need to take the money that we have and spend it differently. So going back to something that we've talked about before, I mean, if you ask a person on the street, um, do you have pets? And if they say, oh, no, you know, I, I just wasn't raised that way. And you say, OK, well, I've got 100 bucks. I can use 100 bucks to save the animal. I can use 100 bucks to destroy the animal. Even though you don't have pets in your life, which one would you like? Um, and they always say, oh, yeah, of course, you know, sa save the animal. Why would we not? So I think that when we make it a logical issue about municipal accountability and about using tax dollars for the highest and best use, even people that don't share their lives with animals can get on board with that. All right, that's great. Um, we, as I said, we wanna answer your questions. If you have any out there, please message us on Facebook or at nokillmovement.org. You can um, hit the contact button, get in touch with us there. We will take a segment every once in a while to actually answer the questions that come through. This was a great meeting. Thank you so much, Alan Rosenberg from New Jersey Animal Observer and Aubrey Cavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville. I'm Dave Smith from No Kill Colorado. We'll talk to you soon.